And welcome to Podlomania Podcast, your photography and video podcast, where we introduce you to some of the most amazing creatives from around the world. I'm your host, Wayne Johns, and I'm here as always with my good friend, buddy, and co host, Jake Hicks. Hey, man. How you doing, buddy? All good? I'm good, mate. I'm good. Yeah, happy, charged, and ready to go on this one because this is a slightly different episode for us. In this one, episode 22, this is just you and me, mate. We have Valentine's done this. episode, Wayne. Valentine's, mate. February 14th, Valentine's episode. I know, man. Nice, nice, I, uh, nice to see you've washed your hair for me. I got the message and I was like, mate, I'm there. It's the two of us. <laughs> Sign me up. Just, 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 I thought you could break into the song then, mate. Just the two of us. <laughs> reminds, reminds I thought me we wouldn't get copyright strike. Don't we do, mate? It's, you know. No, this is, a, this is a fun one. This is just you and me today. So we're, we're actually going to do an episode where we, uh, where we go back in time. Um, we're going to go back in time a little bit today and we're going to talk about analog cameras and shooting film. I that? know. It's, it's, uh, I mean, I think I think both you and I trained on film back in the day. I mean, I know I know I definitely did. You know, we're t- talking about going back over twenty years ago now. Um, you know, when I was, I say classically trained, and I'm holding up air quotes here. But yeah, so uh, <laughs> when, I, when I you know f- trained in the in the ways of film film photography because this is obviously pre pre digital and well certainly pre um, uh, mainstream digital anyway. Um, yeah, and. Me, my first film camera was really my, my father's old Olympus OM1, so uh, 35 mil. But I mean, I mean, I can see it on the um, shelf over there now. I mean, the things. I mean, there 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 was some you still small, got it. You still small got cameras. It. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, amazing, so, I mean, man, the things, I mean, they're small cameras, but like they've just got like two dials on them. It's just it, you know they were so so simplistic, really, when you think about it. And um, I think there's a certain beauty in that. What what, what did you used to shoot on then? What, what, were you, what was your first film camera? But you've got to remember, from a young age, I wasn't actually into photography, photography. You know, if I go back to when I was a, a, a young kid, you know, really small kid, you know, I think less, you know, under 10 years old. Box Brownie. <laughs> I think it was a slate a bit chalk in my day. It's like, <laughs> no, it's, um, you know, I, I, I didn't have a camera, I didn't have a camera, you know, I mean, you know, I didn't, I didn't come from a very well-off family, so... You know, we didn't have these things around and, and none of my family were interested in stuff like that. So my my mum used to have this little Hanimex 135, uh, 110 camera, the 110. And there's a little flip over handle that then revealed the camera inside it. And you just clicked it and wound that little yeah. scroll wheel that sounded like, I don't know, you're running a chopstick over a cheese grater or something, you know, it's... Um, were, and yeah, I like, like the old disposable camera noise. Yeah, yeah. yeah I had the little one ten. You know, those of you that are not aware of what a one ten is, like the film <laughs> Look plane it up is online. the size of a thumbnail, <laughs> as in your thumbnail, as in like tiny, a yeah. fingernail size. Like, I mean, the the one ten. Yeah, it's. I mean, I used to work in a photo lab, and we occasionally got the one tens in, and it was just like, what are we going to do with this? Yeah, yeah, because it was so. You know, the, the camera itself was so small, even back in that day. When, when you folded that handle back over, it enclosed the camera completely. and It, it could fit in your pocket, you know? Um, yeah, oh yeah. But for, me, but for me at that age, I thought that camera was great. I felt like a spy or something, you know, I'd quickly flip yeah. that handle around and take a picture. And then you wanted your mum to develop it. And she'd say no, because it's too expensive. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. Appreciate your thought, though. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, mum. Yeah. Um, so that, that's what I sort of played with as a young, but yes, I, I trained in film as well because digital wasn't around when, when I was learning for sure. So, you know, when, when we talk, we had to learn the old school way. Then obviously we didn't get to see the image straight away because, you know, you didn't have any LCD screen on the back of your camera. Um, the only way we could see any shot that we were doing would be with a Polaroid back and a Polaroid film would come out. The color would look wrong. The exposure would look wrong, but it was basically just for compositional <laughs> purposes. <laughs> yeah, it was for composition, so you could check you yeah. had everything right before you started, you know, investing in pressing a button on that film. But I mean, you say, I mean, it took ages to see the images, and, and yeah, I mean, I mean, we, we used to shoot black and white. We used to dev it ourselves and that sort of thing. But you, but you weren't like you didn't think, oh, this is taking forever because there was no other alternative. It was like this is this is just this is just photography. It's not like this is taking forever. This is just what the only way that that we knew so um yeah but i think it does mean that 
uh, the feedback loop or the learning process uh, is a little bit more delayed. I mean, I know when when I when I was first learning, you'd go out and do a shoot and you'd do a roll of film, and like you could either have a notebook and write down in that notebook all the different things that you tried on the on the like on the day, but really you you were better off just sticking to one thing going right okay this is the exposure that i'm going to go with and this is the setup mm-hmm. that i'm going to go with and just shoot a roll of film like that so but you wouldn't know for a day or so until um if anything had gone wrong so i think that the feedback loop of of learning on film uh was 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 far slower but it mm-hmm. does have a benefit in that you were forced into a situation where you were pre-visualizing the image that you wanted yes. more than we do now. Um, and I make that distinction in some of the training that, that I do at the moment because I see so many of us, and I know you and myself are included in this, um, Wayne, you know, it, it's, it's just the way that we do things now. But mm-hmm. we tend to, I think, set up a shot or shoot a shot, look at the back of the camera and make an adjustment based on what we think yeah. looks better or worse and that sort of yeah. thing. Now, yeah. don't get me wrong, like we all do that and there is nothing yeah. wrong with that process, but it does mean that we can get um, a little bit lazy about pre-visualizing the shot that we want before we do it because with film, you, you, like, you have to. You have to pre-visualize everything yeah. in your mind's eye craft that image in your mind's eye before you even raise the camera to your eye because you, you, you can't, you can't this, this trial and error of taking a shot Make an adjustment, taking a shot, making like you, you couldn't do that. So I think it does change the way that you shoot hugely. Yeah, yeah, and and not only that, you know, I, th- I think I, I agree with you in pre visualizing your shot, and we all perhaps don't pre visualize like we used to in the film days. Those that used to shoot film, but I mean, you know, in, instead now, obviously, digital cameras are so much easier because our LCD is really our Polaroid. But it's just a very convenient Polaroid that we can shoot over and over and over. If we don't like it, we can delete it. It hasn't really costed us cost us anything, except a bit more time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not saying that. Oh, you know, like the good old days where we where we'd have to pre visualize the shot. <laughs> please, I was you know, a don't, boy. Yeah, don't yeah don't misunderstand me when I say this. I'm yeah. saying, not not saying that that was better or anything like that. But I am saying that I think that there is um, there is merit to be had from shooting film today if you've never done it or if you haven't done it in a long time i do think that there is merit in in sort of retraining your brain or retraining your eye to yeah to look at a scene and, and and try and decipher it visually before you bring up that camera to your face i think yeah, yeah, yeah. and we and we're going i think i think for those that haven't shot film and our listeners that haven't shot film i think what what we'll do is we'll get into the breakdown of you know um taking a shot on film and the process and and the process behind say setting up a shot if you're not doing landscape say you're in a studio the process behind that just quickly um before you actually even get into the camera and taking a picture and the skill set required in the setup and seeing light and everything else well i think we'll just go through that little you know simple step-by-step process just to educate those that perhaps haven't shot film and can can understand why it's different it's fair comment yeah you're absolutely right it is it i mean <laughs> I suppose the reason why we've got this episode out or, you know, wanted to put this one together is because I think both you and I have, have recently um, purchased uh, old film cameras again. Yeah. And I think it is surprising to me, although it shouldn't be surprising to me that there are people who, who have never shot film. And I do think that film is seeing a little bit of a resurgence. Um, I know Kodak has said that, um, I, th- I think it was from 2018 to 2019, they, they sold, twice the amount of film or something like that, which is like, yeah. that's not just a, as you know, that's, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not a huge amount, but still the point is that still doubling the, the you know, the, like the, the, the amount of um, film mm. that they were um, yeah. putting out there. But I think that we are seeing a little lift in it. And I do think that we are seeing a generation of photographers coming along now who have never shot film and who don't understand film at all. And this is not a case of, oh, you know, we're going back to film like like no, many of us no. do. We're genuinely seeing a, an entire generation of, of, of people who have never, ever shot film and have really have no clue as to what it's about. And, you know, Indeed. it makes sense, you know, why would yeah, that? Yeah. And- Hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, we we got some good topics to cover in this one, haven't we? I mean, we have got some questions. Um, we got some questions from listeners um, that we've uh, we put out prior to this one, um, so we we can go through some of those. And I think topical wise for for this episode, um, we're going to talk about our own cameras, like the ones you just mentioned, the ones we've recently purchased. Why we we still do it, 
you know, why why are we still shooting film when when digital is so good and so convenient in this modern world and so quick? Um, and we're going to cover other things like, you know, different types of cameras, the cost, um, you know, processing the film, um, the disadvantages of uh, analog cameras, um, you know, exposing a scene, focusing them, different film types um, and how that's relevant compared to digital um, and, and even other bits of equipment you need to shoot um, certain analog cameras um, because obviously you know, a lot of them don't have light meters in them. So, you know, we have to carry extra pieces of kit for that and the developing processes and things. So we've got some good topics to cover. Um, and it'd be quite fun. I think this is a, a nice little episode and um, interesting because we haven't done a, a you and I one since our pilot episode in episode one. Every other episode has been with a guest. Um, really? Yeah. So that's cool. So, I mean, for those listening, I'd also wanted to say before we get into uh, some questions and things that we've got here that, um, you know, don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, um, podlomania.com and all other um, podcast stations. And remember to give us a like and uh, leave us a comment because it helps. I'm going to put that in the beginning this time, mate, just to pre-promote that. (laughs) <laughs> and we've got a new website coming soon as well, haven't we? We've had a, a revamp on a Yeah, I see you've website. Been, you've been working on that. Yeah, it looks it's yeah. looking good, man. Looking good. So that'll be coming soon as well, folks, just to give you some insight into that. Now, let's get into the fun stuff, mate. So why why do we still do it? Why do we still shoot film? Why do you still do it? Um like I said, I, yeah, I, I shot film twenty years ago, and uh, I was I was over the moon to get rid of it back then. As soon as I bought my digital camera, it was just like, "What? Well, this is uh, yeah, I am never going back to that. That's just crazy. That's I mean, how, I mean, I used I mean, shot shot weddings on film, and uh, I, I wouldn't wish that upon anybody. God. Um, so, the, me getting back into it again now was, um, I think it was part of it. I, I wanted to see if I could as well. Like oh, nice, uh, you know. I, I think it's um. I think it's a test thing of of, of your own ability. Uh, from fr- from my point of view, I, I have no interest at all in in trying to you know offer it commercially in in any way whatsoever. I don't, don't want to. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that. Oh, this is going to be a great improvement. Can't wait to go back to film. This is going to be awesome. But <laughs> um, yeah, for me it was it, it, it was it was a test as well to see if I could. And as well, it was for the reasons that I mentioned at the start about trying to get into a different mindset of shooting images, trying to get into this, um, more of a pre visualization of images. And, and, um, I wanted to see if I could do that again. Um, because at the moment, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with where my work is right now, but, yeah. uh, I think I can see myself getting lazy with it with this trial and error process, you know, looking, uh, looking okay. at a shot and making an adjustment, looking at a shot, making an adjustment. And I wanted to try and um, force myself to change that mindset from a learning point of view, you know, setting up a shot, making sure that I'm thinking about everything before I press the button. And another major factor was if I was going to get back into film, it wasn't a case of, well, why don't you just pick up an old 35 mil camera? You know, you can pick those up for, I mean, or, you know, I've got 35 mil cameras here on the shelf. I could just do that. So it wasn't just about, um, getting back into film for the sake of it. I Mm -hmm. I thought if I was going to get back into it, then I wanted to attain a look or achieve a look that I think is quite specific to film that is still not quite there with digital yet. And that is the size of the, of the film plane, like the... In medium um, format. In medium format, yeah. So if I was yeah. going to get back into it, I wanted to get back into as large as I could possibly go without going to the large format, essentially. Mm-hmm. So um, I ended up going for the Pentax 6.7 here, which is a huge film plane, <laughs> absolutely huge. Yeah. Um, Six centimetres by seven centimetres. And when you put it, you know, side by side with, uh, you know, I shoot, Normally, I shoot the uh, Nikon D850, um, which is obviously a full frame camera. And when you put the size of that negative, if you like, that full frame against the 6.7, I mean, it, it's it just dwarfs it. It just makes it look ridiculous. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not about quality because that 6.7 is, is, is obviously not sharper or has higher quality, even though the film plane is far larger. It's not about the quality. It is about the look and the depth of field um, that you get with that far larger. Uh, film plane and like I mean if you go back to the 90s and stuff and look at any Vogue or any Tatler or anything like that they've like the like the shots like the fashion images or the editorial shots that you had in there are all shot in that medium format film and just the the look that they have is is absolutely beautiful and you don't see it now um and Mm. it's very difficult to explain about that depth of field that drop off of 
of focus and just that depth that you have for beautiful headshot that you get with that, that huge film plane very very difficult to try and um verbalize but you know it when you yeah. see it you know it when you see it yeah and and for those who haven't shot film it's probably hard for them to uh understand that description sure. at the moment sure. but um you know i'm sure we, we, we you know we'll you know we'll put some references online somewhere that people can see um or even try and encourage people to go and shoot some maybe yeah. even nicer but i mean i mean yeah, yeah. When I when I was using your Fuji GFX, which is you know medium format in inverted, you know air quotes, mm-hmm. and the uh, beautiful, absolutely incredible images, you know that are absolutely incredible. But you couldn't, in my mind, looking at my portfolio, you couldn't look at all the images on there and go, "Oh wow, that was shot with medium format." Oh, that was yeah. shot with just full frame D850. Yeah, you know yeah. because that like the film plane is still actually not that big is it's it's not huge it's incredible yeah. quality but yeah. the film plane is still actually not that huge so you don't get that 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 beautiful depth yeah that perhaps the the old film medium format is yeah is I, know, I know what you mean and, and to give people an idea you know and when you start moving into medium format there are various sizes of medium format from mm. like 645 Hasselblad 66 Mamiya and Pentax 67 then there's 68 with the Fujifilm G, GWs 69 which is a Fujifilm as well 612 there there are various different different formats in medium format now to give people an example of that you know uh, a six by nine camera only takes eight frames per roll so you get eight shots per roll and hours pentax 67 and my mami rb67 we only get 10 shots out of that yeah 10 on these yeah 10 10 10 shots out of a you know out of a roll of film so you really have to control but in the as a comparison if you were to have a six by nine film camera and you were to have that sensor, that film plane in a digital camera, you were looking that that camera would have to be averaging around a 200 megapixel size sensor to even get close to a six by nine size in terms of um, megapixel relationship. That's a, that's a, that's a r- r- rough average um, in terms of uh, comparisons. So yeah, the, in, in, term, in, that, in that respect, yeah, obviously the larger format in film is bigger than a film sensor. So yeah. What about yourself, though, Wayne? What, why did you decide to get back into it? Um, just, just creativity. I think you, you know we spoke, and you and I, I know we spoke before about sometimes, and we've had this in a question before. How do you keep inspired as a professional? You know, when you're shooting commercial work, especially, and you're shooting everyone else's work, um, and you're shooting what everyone else wants, but with your own style. Um, when you shoot your own work, what do you do differently? Um, and I think this is just a tool to help you shoot differently, think differently, and apply your skill and process differently because you've got to think about shooting a film camera in a different way and there's a lot more variance to take into account and obviously getting that skill set back again Mm. um, and then relating that to the variance that come with analog photography and that is obviously film stock and lens types and lighting conditions and limitations on shutter speed and things as, as you and I both know with sync speeds if you're using flash or strobe. They, they they throw a lot of hurdles in front of you, so it really makes you think and work at it differently, and it, it certainly slows you down because you know you've got a limited number of shots. Um, and I kind of almost want to get that excitement back of when you get that roll of film back and you, you look at it and you go, oh, man, that's beautiful. Or if you've had a bit of a shit day, you go, oh, man, that looks absolute crap. <laughs> <laughs> it's know? tough, man. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, yeah. and I, I mean, I, I've had this um, this uh, Pentax a little while now, and like my first test shoot was horrendous. You know, I had all sorts of issues and problems <laughs> and that sort of stuff. I was sweating and swearing, and like you know, it's just like it, it's it just the way immediately <laughs> comes back. Yeah, immediately comes back as to you know because if because you know because if the flash doesn't fire, like, you you that's a that's a dead shot. You got to you know wind on. You know, it's it's not a case of like oh no worries, just shoot another one. You know, just shoot another one or yeah or like you know the model. Oh sorry, I think I might have blinked. <clears throat> it's not a problem. Yeah. Uh, no yeah, worries. Not, not a problem. <laughs> don't me. Yeah, it's absolutely fine. That's three blinks in one roll. Only got ten shots. Don't, <laughs> yeah. You know, haven't got enough to contend with without you blinking. <laughs> and, and that's and that's and that's the thing as well, isn't it? Where when the flash doesn't fire, that's a mistake you know has happened. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If the model blinks and you can't see it through your fuzzy viewfinder, you don't even know that's happening until you get the bloody shot back until it's been processed. So um, I was. I was almost instantly regretting it um but <laughs> it, but it, it, yeah it, it's 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 a process just like anything else and it it immediately as soon as you know that you have to get that shot right it, it is a psychological thing in your 
like you are instantly more aware of the set. That, that was what I found. Yeah. Like yeah. when I, I had, you know, I had two rolls, I was going to shoot two rolls. Um, it's just like 20 shots at best. There's no way I got 20 shots out of it. <laughs> but like at best, um, it's going to be 20 shots. It's, and so you immediately, the brain, you know, switches into this, you know, overdrive of like, I've got to be thinking about everything. Where's the background? Yeah. Make sure I haven't got any cables sticking out the back of anybody's you know, head or anything like that, make sure that everything's synced up, everything's good, you know. Um, I, you instantly get into that in, into that mindset of everything's yeah. got to be perfect. Yeah. And you've got a plan, you know, if you're shooting with a Huge model, planning, you know, yeah. you've, you've, got to, you've got to know what shots you're after. So your, your shoot planning and your, your, your posing with your model and your series, your set that you're going to shoot, you have to know what you're doing with that before you start firing away all sort of, you know, happy and dandy on that shutter button or you're just going to eat rolls of film. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, my camera, so yeah, you know, I went for the um, Mamiya RB67 Pro. Obviously, our cameras are slightly different. I mean, yours has a prism finder where you look through it like a normal DSLR. It um, looks like a, it just looks like a jumbo yeah, yeah, it's a <laughs> got a, yeah, it's yeah, got a yeah. big forehead, hasn't it? Your <laughs> big forehead. That's true. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, mine, mine is very, uh, very boxy in shape. Very, very sort of square. classically medium format. Yeah. Classically medium format. Yeah, we are talking just medium format at the moment. And and mine's got a waist level finder. They're the ones that little that pop up the little hood on the top, and you actually look down into them from above. And they have a little magnifier in there that you can pop out that flips up in the lid, so you can do your fine focus. Now the difference being in these cameras, I used to shoot the. RZ67 Pro 2, um, its bigger brother, or its newer brother. Um, and I used to shoot that a lot in the industry, even though I started out on an RB67 Pro uh, in, in the early days. And I, I'm just used to that camera. I, I love that style camera and its format and, and the way it works. And that, for me, is just reinvigorated. A bit of love in that respect. Obviously, differences between our cameras. Yeah, yours has a yeah yours has a couple of benefits over mine and, and, and vice versa. So I think there's definitely yes. pros and cons for... For each. Yeah, exactly. So I've got a waist level finder. The joy is I can detach that one and put a what we call a chimney finder on it, which is just a magnified version you look down through, or a prism finder, so I can look through it like a normal camera and everything's the right way round. And I say that the right way round for those that haven't shot film. Currently in a medium format, everything I look through in my waist level finder, everything is the wrong way round. It's because it's just the one the way, mirror. Yeah. It's the one people, mirror coming in. People forget nothing. that DSLRs and that sort of thing has several mirrors in there which yeah. which actually corrects it back to normal. They have yeah. the pentaprism inside yeah. which corrects the image and I don't have that. So everything's back to front. So when you tilt one way it actually goes the other. So get get your brain around that as well before you even start shooting. And obviously I can't put mine on its side and look through because it's a waist level finder. But the R B stands for rotating back. So I can turn my six centimeter by seven into a seven centimeter by six. So basically I can turn it into a landscape format or portrait just by rotating the back on the film. So that's one of the other major features. And I say features because it was back in the day, although people don't, people don't talk about it now, but many medium format cameras, yours in, in particular, and uh, m- many other ones have, uh, it's, it's, it's like a modular system. So you have the lens, you have the body in the middle, you have yep. the prism or the area w- you know, in which you actually view the image, and then you actually have the back, which is where the film goes. So you have yes. those, those, those four main Lego bricks, if you like, that you can switch in and out for, for whatever you want. Obviously, the lenses and stuff, we're, we're, you know, we're obviously yep. used to. Um, the way that you view the image, you can switch in and out for, you know, whether you're shooting landscape or street or, and then the, and then the back. Now, mine, on the other hand, is pretty much, um, one and done in that, for one, like I load the film like you would do a regular 35mm camera. So it doesn't have a back that pops off yep. that I can change in and out. So on one hand, that's, that's great. On the other hand, it's, it, it's also a pain because it means that, uh, if I load a color film, then I have to shoot that entire roll of color films at all 10 shots before I can yeah, switch exactly. out to, like, maybe I wanted to shoot some color, maybe I wanted to shoot a couple of shots on black and white before I change the next set. Now I have to shoot an entire roll of film before I can before I can switch, switch. that out. Whereas you have the ability to obviously switch in and out different film. Maybe, maybe like, yeah. you know what, I actually only need 100 ISO film for this one. I can just That's pop it. in 100. Um, yeah. For me, as soon as I put a hundred in, that's it. Um, I can't. Yep. I can't. Locked. Well, I can't just change the ISO like you can do on digital cameras. <laughs> no, you can't do shot that with to film. shot. You know, you have to no. as soon as you as soon as you lock that roll of film in at that hundred ISO, four hundred ISO. That's it. So you know, I was doing a shoot. Was it yesterday, day before? And I was like, "What film should I use for this?" I'm not sure what the lighting is going to be just yet. So I put in a you know a roll of four hundred, and then it was a case of me using ND filters. So you know, you're, you're back to that. Stop it down. Okay. You're back to that way of having a bit more control with your apertures using ND filters. Those yeah. of you that don't know, they're just they're just grey sheets of glass that goes in front of the lens 
lens that reduces the amount of light that comes through the lens. Coming in. Um, but I guess for you then, if you've got an ND filter on, then obviously your your viewfinder's darker because there's nothing digital, it's all analogue. So focusing for you then would be a right old pain in the ass. Very difficult. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. as soon as you put anything in front of the lens that's going to reduce the light, yes, it reduces the amount of light that's coming through the viewfinder as well. So yeah, y- yeah focusing that, y- y- focusing is hard enough anyway, but focusing with two stops darker now becomes increasingly difficult um so i mean like there are all these you know these, these are new problems for well i say new problems uh, they're, they're new as in they're new to what we're used to with digital um you know we, we don't have that we can you know we don't have any of that because autofocus for one oh, is God, yeah. just unbelievably good in, in yeah. I, mean, <laughs> yes. I mean it's especially in the mirrorless i mean the mirrorless ones yeah. are i mean <laughs> Just and EVF, easy. yeah, mirrorless EVFs are bright. Yeah, yeah. brightens it so, up anyway. And that's so if you haven't shot film, go in, go and shoot film, and and then tell me that you're going to complain about the autofocus in your digital cameras. True enough. <laughs> Seriously, uh, you go and shoot film, it'll stop you complaining about your autofocus in your in your cameras completely. <laughs> so how do you manual focus on on your on your? You got the RB, did you say? Yeah, I got the RB. So mine mine focus is slightly different than yours because uh, your focus on your six sevens on your lens. Correct. Yep. Um, whereas uh, with the Mamiya RB systems, the the front part of the camera is on a bellows rail system, That's right, which yeah. is tucked away in the body. And my my focusing levers, I have two knobs on either side of the camera, so you know suited for left or right hand focusing. And I can basically just wind my bellows in and out, and that brings the lens further away or closer to the the film plane inside the camera. Crazy, focusing. isn't it? So, so very quick in that respect. You know, because some old lenses can be quite hard to turn for focus, can't they? Oh, the, I presume the, it's easier. As, I mean, especially if you're waist level finding as well, uh, you, you know, you are like your both hands are actually on the camera rather than one hand on the camera and then one loose on the lens. It does make yes. it, you know, far more stable. Yeah you, yeah. yeah, you can cradle it, you know, in both hands really underneath. So you're holding it quite secure and close to your body. So it's good in that respect. How do you know when it's in focus? So in, in, in sort of medium format cameras, um, in, in, a, in a lot of them, you can change the focusing screens that you view down in the top. You're what we call the ground, the, the ground glass. So we can, we can change those. And they come with some variants where you can have the old split line through the middle and when the, Which the image is, lines up the ones up on I that, prefer. Yeah, so when the image lines up on that split line and it marries up, you know your camera's in focus. The one in mine is literally just a clear glass screen, so your eyes have to be oh, good. You see, to, you're just to so you're, you're even worse off than I am. I, I, I yeah. So, so mine is a little circle in the middle, and that, that and then that little circle is filled with fifty little diamonds. That when all yes. the diamonds line up, but I would prefer it's just sure. a regular split in the middle, like that's what I'm used yeah. to from film. It's just far clearer yeah. to see when something's lined up. This is just a million and one little diamonds that you think, yeah, yeah it's probably yeah, they're probably sharp. <laughs> But yeah, you're I even worse I, off than me then. So you are yeah. literally doing it by eye. That's it. Yeah, by, by eye, yeah. Yeah. So luckily I've got the little magnifier that pops up in the waist yeah. level finder so you can at least see a bit more. But, you know, I mean, with my eyesight now at my age, it's even even that poses problems sometimes when you think you're in focus and then you breathe a little bit and you think, oh, yeah, shit, no, I'm not. Yeah. Um, the only benefit I would say is that because of the larger film plane, I would say that you can be a little bit more, uh, how can I explain this? You can, you can certainly, you can certainly be <laughs> off with your focus and get away with it. Like the, like looks, the smaller the film plane gets, if you're off yeah. by a tiny amount, it's like, whoa, is yes. that a focus? Yeah. Um, but yeah. I have noticed even already on my, <laughs> <laughs> speaking for a friend, um, but uh, yeah, I've even noticed already that you can actually miss focus on even at f2.4 and you can still get uh, yeah it's still looking it's still looking fine. just looking good <laughs> or creatively it's still looking creamy <laughs> yeah and and obviously with with mine you know the differences that come into that as well is that um i've got a little dark slide i have to pull out between my film back and my camera um which slots in this it's got a little seated position it slots in the camera to keep it tucked out of the way so you don't lose it or so damage you're it referring to a piece a sheet of metal that sits metal. between the film and the camera body yeah. yes and it basically it's light tight. So when you take the back off, it means you're not exposing the film to light and, and ruining all your film. But yeah, the good thing is I can change those backs. So I can have one back with black and white in, one back with colour in. And I can swap between the two or swap between ISOs or ASAs back then. I can swap between those, you know, a 160 or a 400 if my light changes. And I can swap those out without affecting the film in mid-roll and, and just put them back on again. Mine comes with a bit of a slower shooting process in terms of um, forwarding the film. In terms of, you know, when you shoot a frame and you want to then manually cock the shutter in the camera to take your next picture. Imagine all these people who only shoot digital going, what what the heck is cocking the shutter? 
It's a little lever on the camera that you spring loaded, it pushes down and it cocks your mirror and your shutter up mm. ready for the next shot. And we'll get into those on both our cameras in a minute. But mine's a bit slower. So I actually have two cocking levers on mine. One of them is to cock my shutter. And then I also have um, a forward advance lever on my film back. So I have to wind the film on one frame and then cock my shutter on the camera before I can take a shot. Now, again, that has benefits and minuses. Now, I mean, I, so I, I mean, the, the film camera that I've been shooting on up until this point, I'm shooting Polaroid on it, was a uh, Mamiya Universal Press. And that had the same thing. Oh, where you, yes. So you, yeah. cock the, you cock the actual lens itself. The shutter is, or like the leaf is on the, leaf shutter is on the actual lens itself. Yep, so yep. you can... I, I actually prefer that method in the studio because when you have control of the light, I mean, if, if I have a misfired flash, there's not enough ambient light to affect the film. So if a, if a, if a flash misfires, then I can just recock the shutter and take another shot yes, without it affecting good. because the ambient light is so low, it's yeah. not affecting the film. But like if, if a flash misfires on my Pentax 67 now, I can't yeah. do that. I ha- when, when I yeah. recock the shutter, it's rewinding another frame. I can't That's bypass right. that that option so yeah like, there, there are pluses and minuses yes you have to you have to yeah. do two things um but if something buggers up then at least you have that ability to take an that action. safety net yeah yeah and 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 like both of ours really when you look at my camera you know it's com- it's completely 100 percent mechanical there's no electronics in it whatsoever. No battery no electronics no nothing no battery in yours so yours doesn't have a light meter then no so the the rb um that's that's where the difference between the rb and the rz come into play the rz is electronic and it has contacts where the lens can talk to the camera and vice versa, shutter speeds and everything else, um, and it auto-advances your film and everything else. You can get automatic film backs for the RB67s, battery versions, and they automatically wind the mm, film on, so you only yeah, have to yeah, cut yeah. one lever. Yeah. But the RB is completely manual, so it is a, literally a mechanical device with cogs and wheels and things and springs. But like both of ours, all your controls, your aperture... Obviously, we don't have an ISO setting on our cameras because obviously uh, that, that's the film type that you put in that, that governs that. Both our apertures and the apertures and shutter speeds are on my lens. Shutter speeds as well are on your lens. <clears throat> yeah, shutter speeds, because obviously my, my box is just a mechanical device. So if you take my lens off and take my film back off and take my waist level finder off and the ground glass screen out, you, if your hand was small enough, you could put your hand straight through. There's nothing in there. <laughs> Empty box. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a magician's. <laughs> it's like a, like a magician's box. So on on my one, my apertures and uh, my my shutter speeds are on the lens. And um and you know if you want to attach a flash system to that, then you need the old PC sync cable, which you can connect to a pocket wizard. But that connects to the lens as well, not the camera. Again, yeah, I think that's yeah, I think that has its benefits as well in terms of the um, shutter sync speed as well. So, what what can you sync yeah. your shutter to, or your flash to on that? Yeah, cause it's leaf shutter, so you can you can do the whole range of shutter speeds. But 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 get this. <laughs> so just just quickly, a leaf shutter means that there's an iris that opens and closes like a circular door, as opposed to um, Hasselblads were famous for syncing to any sh- um, shutter speed back in the day for that as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, completely. Yeah, so your shutter speed your your shutter is in the lens and, and not in the in the camera so yeah whereas so that my enables... particular lens here doesn't doesn't have that so I, i'm I'm, oh, I'm, I I'm limited to a 30th of a second sync speed so with flash with flash Man. yeah so i need to be careful with ambient slow, light isn't it? yeah i need to be careful That's with slow. ambient light yeah and there's all these people complaining about modern medium formats that the 125th isn't fast enough <laughs> with with the modern flash durations that we have in modern flashes oh really is that a complaint <laughs> is it 125 yeah 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 a lot of people yeah do complain oh you know it'd be nice if it was faster than 125th sync speed for flash just as a little tangent there what just briefly why do you think that they're sort of um grumbling about that is it just because the quality of those cameras is just so ridiculously high that any movement in ambient is 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 noticeable i don't know i i don't think i don't think it's a complaint or a grumble from the your commercial work in pros. I think it's the enthusiast market, to be fair, from, from what I can gather. People forget that flash technology and flash duration, the faster the flash duration in, in flash or strobe units is advanced also. So I don't really see, you know, in the older days, if you take one of your, you know, I know you still got some old Bowens units. If you mm-hmm. take one of your old Bowens units and look at the flash duration of that and you were to shoot, say, a model that's moving. It's very in, generous, in, yeah. It's very generous. And you, were to shoot a <laughs> and you were to shoot at a 125th of a second in studio, you could still possibly have some movement because your flash duration was quite 
slow. You could have a little bit of blur. Uh, yeah, but I mean, when we say slow, I mean, it's still like thousandths of a second. I mean, it's still, yeah. it's, yeah. it's not... Yes, you're right. I mean, I, I remember that that was one of the issues, you know, especially with models where moving and the hair and that sort of stuff. The hair was was yeah. always blurry, and that wasn't. Yeah. That had nothing yeah. to do with the shutter speed. It was to do with the with the the, the old Xeon gas traveling around that tube, uh, just casually exactly. traveling traveling around the tube. Yeah, um, exactly. Which is a period yeah. of time. Yeah. Yeah, so I think a lot, a lot of the grumbles come from you know more the enthusiast market when you know they don't realise that any, any strobe you're using nowadays is far faster than the flash durations we used to have. So yeah, I mean, it's like, is, you know, I mean, even, even cheap strobes now you can get four thousandths of a second and stuff. It's you know it's uh... yeah. So so you're you're um, on your system. You're locked down to a thirtieth of a second sync speed. Now on on your particular lens that you've got on a, with your with your camera, what's your maximum shutter speed of your six seven? So on the dial here, my, the um, sh- shutter speed on mine is actually on the body. So again, as you would normally, you would expect yep. to find the shutter speed on a SLR on the body as well. So it goes up to a yep. thousandth. Yeah. Okay. Well, he's get get this. I I can I can sync with flash through all of my shutter speeds on my on my lens. I've currently got the 127 mil 3.5, which is a bit like a 90 mil kind of thing in DSLR terms. But my maximum shutter speed. So Wayne's speed, just glossed over that again. But yeah, just say that lens bit again. Oh, 127 mil lens um, on the on the the, the six seven is a bit like an 80 to 90 mil comparison on a DSLR. And we say that comparison because of this because of the change in in the film plane. It's like going yes. from uh, micro four thirds to, up to uh, full frame. It's like there's different mils of the lens and the equivalent of, of full frame. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. But I can use all my shutter speeds, but my maximum shutter speed, which is on my lens, is one four hundredth of a second. Well, four hundredth. So, that's it. Yeah, on the yeah, four hundredth of a second on that camera. So that's ambient light or flash. It's, it's the same, whatever. Okay. So okay, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to test this old thing at thousands of a second. That I'll be totally honest. <laughs> It'd probably blow. I know. Probably right. just. I mean, it, like it sounds like somebody is slamming a small door. Uh, I'm. I'm just going to cock it a second, and then and then you can you can hear it. Okay. A little bit of silence. Okay. One more time. One more time. One more time. Oh, shock. <laughs> oh my. Okay, so that's a thirtieth of a second. Oh, yeah. That's it's that's that's a beautiful sound. I I can't fire mine because I've got a roll of film in it. So I was just uh, trying to finagle it whilst you were talking then, because yeah, te- this has a this has a function that stops you from firing it. So I had to trick the camera into thinking there was film in it. Yeah, my, mine's got a lever on the back that um you can fire it without any film in it. So you can't fire you can't take the film back off with the dark slide and fire it then. Yes, you can. Yeah, yeah. You can certainly, yeah. Just pop the levers off. You can't do it now. Off then. and you can cock it, and fire it. Then, yeah. But oh, I, I want to hear it. Yeah, I can if you want to hear the sound of it. Really? <laughs> okay. Keep keep talking. Then, when I just, just the wait. Oh, the just just to give people an idea, we're going to get into this as well, right? This 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 RB six seven, which is the smaller brother, smaller brother of the RZ six seven, actually weighs more than the RZ six seven. This this little beast weighs a very nice. 6.6 pounds with the lens on it. That is almost twice the weight of a Fujifilm GFX 100. Just let people know. It's heavy. It's <laughs> yeah. heavy. My cocking lever is on the side of the camera. And shutter. Oh. That's a sweet sound, isn't it? It is, yeah. Did, did you want it again? Yeah, I did. Come on. <laughs> Look at that. Nice. And that was a 60th of a second. There you go. <laughs> it's i mean like, like i said i mean there, there is literally quite literally somebody slamming a small door <laughs> yeah I, I, i'm not gonna i'm not gonna lie when i shot it the other day i was hand holding it and and holy shit man my wrists were aching so much from holding it in that position while trying to focus and keeping it still yeah well i mean and that, that's that's the thing i mean won't go into the fine details but yeah i mean the, the one that i've got is is uh because they made several versions of this Pentax yes. 6 or 7. But this is like the, the, the middle one. And the, the, one of the uh, benefits of this one is the ability to lock up the mirror. So the mirror is out of the way that enables you to um, fire it without that mirror slapping it up and down. Because we, like, like I said, there is a, there's a lot of noise coming from those cameras. And that's because there's huge amounts of mechanics moving around very quickly, which will obviously blur the image if, if you're not careful. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm intrigued to hear on playback how those sounds how those shutters yeah. sound in those cameras. Yeah. Obviously, it sounds different to us currently in our headphones. But um, yeah, I mean, that, that's that's that. So they're, they're very different systems. And obviously, we're talking about medium format. 
But um, I mean, let's, let's just get into, um, and we will get onto the film that we've got on in a minute and about ISO range or, you know, film speed and things like that, because obviously we're, we're governed by that like we covered. You know, I, I still know some pros that still shoot film commercially, it's still, you know, because it is more expensive to do. You know, you get less less shots and then there's the processing bill and then obviously the process of it, you've then got to scan the film to get it digitally into a computer anyway. Uh, you know, absolutely. So I mean, all that costs. So I mean, let's, let's just say for argument's cheap. sake that, I mean, like we get 10 shots, say for argument, I mean, I, this, you can get, you can get some film for 10 pounds, like a roller 120 film for 10 pounds. And then, you know, I can get it deved and scanned for 10 pounds. So, you know, that means that's 20 quid to get a roll of 10 shots. So that's two pounds an, an image. That's two, two pounds, pounds a shot. Yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> That's without your time. Yeah. Just I mean, cost you know, materials. we used, we used to grumble like all bloody hell about Polaroid, but <laughs> I mean, you know, that's the, that was, that was half the price of this. <laughs> True. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it like, yeah, it's, it's certainly not, not cheap. Um, so a, a, again, it, you know that, that that plays another factor in you, you know, wanting to make sure that each each shot is some um, perfect for sure. I, I buy 120 roll film in a pack of, in a box of five, and it's around fifty pound a box. So mm. it is it's not cheap. But you know, you don't have to go medium format. You can always go thirty five mil. And the, the the benefit of you know, I would encourage people just creatively to perhaps go and learn about film because I mean, personally, I think it will also train your eye, your mind, your brain, and your approach a lot more than it will it does, machine it does, gunning sure. digital. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 You'll learn a lot more, especially you'll you'll learn to see light and you'll learn how to mess up film and not mess up film because also you can't change the ISO range mid roll as we just said. But have have a go at it. I mean there are thirty five mil cameras, there's plenty of them online that are in reasonable condition that you can pick up really, really cheap. I mean, oh, I've still yeah. got some I mean, ca- Canon chances A1s are, you know, your away here. family's got an old 35mm camera in the attic somewhere or something like that, you know. Yeah, 100%. It's a shame we haven't got a film sponsor for today's episode, really, isn't it? You know, it could be people free going film, out buying film cameras. Yeah, I'll, I'll have some free film. Uh, influx of cheap film. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh, that, that, that whole process of shooting and, and uh, I think we've become super afraid of making mistakes at, at the mm. moment with um modern modern shooting and, and i think you know we're, we're our own worst enemies for that you know we, of, of you know we don't share any mistakes and we and we certainly don't acknowledge that we ever make any mistakes with digital it's all perfect everything's pin sharp everything's correctly exposed and that's yeah. the way it should be and that sort of thing now don't get me wrong of course that's that's great that's what we all aspire to do of course but i will say that we can fall into this trap as well of the image is looking a little bit saccharine um, and uh, uh, just just a little bit contrived at the moment. And, and all of our images are, are, are in danger of looking a bit vanilla, a bit just just all the images looking the same because of how perfect they are. Um, yeah, too sharp, too sharp. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that that's not what you should aspire to do. As absolutely, by all means, aspire for perfection definitely do that i will say though that i do remember with um when shooting film is that mistakes would happen and sometimes those mistakes would be like huh that's pretty cool that's interesting yes oh, i hadn't yeah. oh, i hadn't thought oh i wonder what's happening there oh i see that's because of you know one two three things happening and i miss that sort of excitement of like oh that's cool yeah. that's interesting that's different uh which that just doesn't happen now that just does not happen now because we don't make mistakes anymore it's all just you know that's working that's working that's working um you know and we get into that routine of it being perfect and, and uh now i know at the start i said how frustrating and you know annoying it was to be to to, to be making these mistakes, but sometimes you can get happy accidents that are just like, wow, I love that look. I love that. That hasn't fired. That looks really cool. Um, like my first role of uh, test film, I think I shared it on- online. Yeah. But, um, the flash didn't fire, so it was just the ambient shot. Now, it was just the one light that fired and uh, uh, there was this plant behind the model and it just cast this beautiful shadow. Now, in my original image with the flash, I had no intention of there being... Uh, a shadow from the plant because it was all lit. Um, but the resulting image is actually pretty cool because the flash didn't fire and it was just this beautiful um, shadow of the plant being cast where ordinarily I hadn't planned for that. And it was just, I think it just proved my point even immediately on that first test roll that it, like it's okay to make mistakes. It's it's yeah. okay, you know, um, because those the, the, those mistakes are really the seeds of creativity. You know, every mistake that you make, you're forced into a position to try and do something different. And by doing something exactly. different, you are inherently being creative. And I think that there is a lot to be um, taken from that. Yeah. I agree, man. I mean, happy mistakes are sometimes happy mistakes. It sounds wrong, doesn't it? It sounds so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Only in my filthy mind, Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> God, 
Happy accidents, yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy accidents, yeah. Um, make of that what you will. <laughs> now, I, I agree. I, I think when you get those moments and, and something breaks down somewhere mechanically, you know, or, 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 you know, your equipment together, that when you get a result that you never had in your mindset, that that, that is, it, it then opens your mind up and go, oh, wow. So if I don't have that like that, then I can get this kind of thing in there as well, which I never anticipated. Like you say, those, those happy yeah. accidents, mate, can, mm-hmm. can be creatively rewarding. For sure, absolutely. Way. Okay, so let's um let's let's just um I mean the people that shoot film are going to know this and they're going to be like boring. I already know, but you know we our audience is very vast and there's a lot of people out there have only known the digital world. You know, if 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 you're shooting in an environment where the lighting has is is changing, let's say it's easy on a digital camera, as we know that if we want to adjust any anything in our camera settings and we don't want to change our aperture for our depth of field and we don't want to change our shutter speed. We know that if our light changes and gets a bit brighter or darker, we can change our ISO quite easily. We just change it on the damn dial. But in film, obviously, that's not the case. You know, once you put your roll of film in, you you buy your film to the speed which is light sensitive for your subject matter. You're locked into it. Yeah, yeah. You're locked into it. So, you know, if you want to shoot at, say, ISO 160 digitally, and you want to go and shoot that with film, you buy a roll of ISO 160 film or ASA film. Once you put that in your camera, you've got to expose for 160. You can, you can expose your film as 320 and, and, and sort of push the, the film, as we call it, pushing it. But then you have to expose the whole roll at 320. You can't shoot a frame at 320 and a frame at 160 because that film has to be developed for a certain amount of time and temperature at the said ISO to get the correct exposure of your roll. Um, so that, that actually, so that's, actually happened to me on the, on the, on the um, test shoot. So the first roll I put through, obviously the flash mm-hmm. was, wasn't firing. So I was like, look, I've got another roll here. I want to use it, um, but I, 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 you know, I don't want to rely on the flash. So I'm going to shoot hot lights. Um, uh-huh. So the roll was 100 ISO. And I was like, look, with, with hot lights, I don't really quite have enough power to be able to um, shoot this at 100 ISO. So I was like, look, let's rate this film at 400 which is two stops, yeah. 200, you know, 100 to 200, one stop, 200 to 400, two stops. So that means that I then tell the lab that I've rated this at 400, you need to dev this at 400, which just means like you've just said, they need to dev it for longer or develop that film for longer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it develop, is possible, developing process and time. But yeah. there are downsides to doing that. The film is not designed to be pushed and pulled, um, but you can certainly use that to your advantage. So it was a black and white yeah. film and it came back, you know, like... What? Whoa, 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 stop the tape, stop the tape. <laughs> <laughs> well, thankfully it was black and white. I was did, shooting hot lights, so it was all going to be tungsten. Did, <laughs> for our audience, did did the whole audience just hear the words look, from Jake Hicks look, to say... I didn't shoot any shooting. landscape orientation. <laughs> Black and white. This is this is the man who lives in a world of color, who's had many a debate with me previously about black and white and color. This is a man who just I'm not confessed. Gonna get, you're not going to bait me into <laughs> losing my rag on, on why I think um, there is a time well, and a place for black and white. And, oh yeah, and, here it comes. Uh, uh, I rarely see it. <laughs> so do we, mate? From you, to be honest. <laughs> Welcome to my world, Jake. <laughs> Don't give me that. Anyway. Anyway, <laughs> so um, I mean, I just I just stumbled into another thing there, but the because I was shooting hot lights, hot lights are tungsten bulbs, so tungsten. Yes, I was going to say, can you going to say that, yeah. it is is very warm, you know? So it, it, in our in our world of white balance or Kelvin, you know, you're looking at about two and a half thousand, three thousand Kelvin. Now, if you just shoot that on normal color film, that would come out very very orange. You, you can't just change the white balance on film cameras. You know, you have to no. either use um, specific color changing gels on the lights. So CTBs, color temperature blue gels on the lights or shoot black and white like, like I did. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's the, that's the thing as well for people out there, you know, you do still get daylight balanced film and tungsten mm-hmm. balanced film yeah. in terms of in the, in the color world. Um, so if you're shooting with tungsten lights like Jake's hot lights, then yeah, if, if it's tungsten and you haven't got any uh, color correction gels um, for your camera or your lights, then you, you need to go and get a tungsten film. So there is, um, there is, a, and, you know, there is, is a lot to um, think about and um, consider we, at, at, at every stage of the uh, of the process. Yeah, I mean, like the easiest thing to do was just for me to put color temperature blue gels on on, on the lights, but 
you know yeah that again yeah. is taking away power from those from those lights so i was you know i really just wanted to just wanted to get some shots so anyway yeah pushed it to 400 came back and as a result the contrast like some of the some of the blacks and dark greys side to you know crunch up together and that sort of thing it's, yes it's a, it's yes. A, it's, a, it's that's a the downside it is yeah, yeah. But you can use that to your advantage you know people do it um in cinema all the time to you know like to get a get specific look um, and whilst we're on that, you, you speaking about ISOs and choosing the right film for the, you know, for the right job, I would say that um, film types is what many digital people now refer to as like presets, you know. Presets, yes, you know, you, completely. Like, with film, <laughs> you are inserting the preset into your camera at, at, at the time of shooting. You know, Fuji you film had a, yeah, exactly. Fuji film has a different look to Kodak, and you know, yes, you know, different types of uh, you know Fuji films will have different colors and, and looks and, and and feels as well. So exactly, and th- th- there's a prime example, I think. You know, because um, I used to shoot Fuji film a lot, and uh, we've got to remember uh, for those that don't know, you know, you've got you've got negative film. You know, where you shoot a, a, a neg, which obviously everything is reversed when you look at it, but you also have positive film or slide film. E six, um, where the it, yeah. E6 has a 41 for processing. So slide film is the image as you would see it in a picture um, or you put it in a slide projector and you can play it. And negative film obviously then has to be scanned in and reversed so you can see the picture properly. When you come to Fujifilm types and Kodak types, they, they are very different. And a prime example is like Fuji Provia um, is a very clean colour film, but the whites have a little bit of a green cast in them. So that's already baked in. If you didn't want that, you'd have to change that after scanning the neg or, or, or positive into the computer system and changing the white balance digitally. I appreciate that sounds terrible when 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 Wayne says it out loud like that. Yeah. Oh, it's got a bit of a green color. Like, what the hell? Like, it, it's yeah. it's it's not as bad as it sounds. Especially, I mean, like, I, I perhaps wouldn't shoot that in the studio, but I think if you're shooting daylight stuff, as you know, as, as, especially if you have a lot of um, clear skies, or something like that, you you can get some really beautiful colder Beautiful. it's more of a just think of it as yes. a colder tone rather than the, rather than a green hue <laughs> yeah and if you if you compare that to say kodak porter like 160 or 400 or 160 yeah. i love that that's a very warm tone like very noticeably different and then it also makes the fuji look greener because it's so warm where in fact if you were to take a zero white balance the kodak is too warm and the fuji is too green if you wanted to put that analogy on but a Kodak Porter is beautiful it's got quite a flat color profile to it so it's beautiful for fashion and portrait if you wanted to really ramp up your colors for for portrait uh, for fashion like I used to use in the day um, I used to use Velvia slide film um, which was super saturated. Um, One of the reasons that, that those films are, are doing that is is what is what we used to refer to as a film latitude, which is uh, it, a latitude is the is the area of or, or, or the the how should we say the effectiveness of a film in in terms of its lightness. So if you have something that yes. was two stops underexposed, it would go to black. If you had like a like an E six or slide film, it would have a very small latitude, usually of about one to two stops at most. Anything above if you had anything underexposed by two stops, anything overexposed by two stops in that scene, it would go either very, very bright or very, very dark. So you end up with this very contrasty image because that film has a very narrow latitude. And when you're talking about colour, when you increase the contrast of colour, you are inherently also increasing the saturation. So when people yes. talk about, oh, I don't do anything in in you know to my RAWs and that sort of stuff, it's bullshit. Because like <laughs> bullshit. a RAW is not is, is not represented. It's got an algorithm yeah, on exactly. it already. <laughs> like that GFX you know, was it 11 stops of latitude or something? The thing is, the thing is, is dead flat. That's, I mean, that's beautiful because you have all that data to work with, but nobody in their right mind would publish that straight out of camera. Um, and, you know, film had that preset, to, you know, already in there. So though, that's why people like to shoot transparency or the, or, or the E6 was because of that beautiful contrast and that beautiful saturation, thanks to the latitude of the film. Good, good way of putting it as well. You know, having different film types is like, you know, using presets in a digital world, you know, but it is baked in. And, but the thing is, you know, you've got to pick film speed relevant to what you're going to do. And if you are shooting film outdoors in ambient light and your cloud cover comes over and you've already got 100 ISO, ISO film in your camera and then that lovely sunny day turns into cloud, then you're going to have to change your shutter speed or your apertures to get that light back in because there's no other option if your roll of film is in your camera. Unless, of course, you've got like a removable back like me and you just chuck a roll of 400 you can do that yeah that is just the other (laughs) benefit yeah 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 but i mean yeah film types i mean uh there's still plenty out there you can still get it i mean 
in, in my camera at the moment currently, my RB67, um, I've got a roll of Fuji Acros black and white, which is a super crisp, punchy, contrasty black and white film. And it is still made today and uh, they do the Acros Mark II version. So it is still in production. Um, very, very much so. And I love that stuff. Other black and white film I love. Um, I love the Kodak Tri-X. That's, that's a nice one for me, which I like. Um, it's, it's got a nice grain to it. Um, not as contrasty. Um, but um, it has a nice grain structure. But people got to remember that, you know, this is physical emulsion-based film with layers of emulsion and silver halide pieces in there. Um, and like that, so, but it, th- that that look is far more organic. It's something in, inherent yes, to organic. us as, uh, as 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 humans, as other organic beings. Like we are, we are drawn to it. I mean, you hear people talking about music, or people talking about vinyl. You know, like they talk about all that, the, the warmth yeah. of the sound. Like that doesn't make any sense. Like that, that there is something, there's, there's an ineffable quality of this of, of that analog procedure that that we that we are inherently drawn to. And like we see people talking about the warmth of sound, that makes no sense. But but it is the same with film as well. There is a certain look yeah. to it that is a more of an organic look that feels that that, that just feels right. Um, yeah. And when you talk about you know color color in film, um, the way that color sort of blends and, and and bleeds and mixes in in film is is very different to the way that it happens on a digital plane. You know, like we talk about our oh, yes. color banding and digital, and yeah, it is a pain, <laughs> but you didn't really get color banding per se in in film because it doesn't it doesn't have that same doesn't have that same issue or the, 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 you know that same makeup. Um, so you can get some beautiful colors without any problems at all with um, banding, just because of the you know like the film grain and that the emulsion yeah. is, is 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 blending them so. So, like, just so beautifully, yeah. Structural, yeah, completely. But I mean, overall, I, I think you know, if people haven't ever shot film, you know, it doesn't have to be expensive to try it out. Um, there are plenty of. You don't have to buy a medium format camera. There are thirty five mil cameras, plenty on eBay. It's finding one in good condition where the lens doesn't have fungus in it, and things like that, because they're prone to in the older days because of the coatings and the way they were sealed. Talk about that. So this, like the, the, these, these old lenses um, had like this is a this is this is an old uh, tam. T- Takuma lens. This is the and it's a one hundred and five, but it has um, a, a rather orange look to it, or a warm look to it, because I think it, it like these old lenses were coated in <laughs> in thorium, which is essentially radiation and cyanide. So <laughs> like well. it has a warmer look to it as well. But they, they, you're talking about old lenses and fungus and that sort of stuff. But yeah, this is um, yeah. I mean, you, you couldn't even make these now uh, the, these exactly. lenses because of the the ratings. <laughs> oh, we had the same thing. We were speaking to um, MD of Panavision, Jeff. There, he was saying that their, yes. their lens is a coated right. in lead, you know, um, yes. which you can't sell legally, but they're a very sought after look um, because of the, because of what happens to the light as it passes through them. And it's, and it's the same with, with, with this lens, this lens I have on this um, Pentax is very sought after. And part of that is to do with the thorium coating that is on it. Yeah. At, at the end of the day, you know, for, for people, we encourage you to go out and, you know, especially for those that whether you're a amateur or professional, if you're hitting a bit of flat spot creatively and you don't know what to do because, you know, everything's so, I say easy quite loosely in a digital world. It's so convenient in a digital world. And sometimes you, you don't put the, perhaps so much of the thought process in the application of your skill rather than just your content subject. So may, maybe, you know, if you, if you want to uh, test yourself and, and, and push yourself, push your limits a little bit more, go out there and pick up a nice little film camera, whether it be 35 mil or medium format. And um, go and go and find some roles and 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 teach yourself how to shoot film if you don't already know how to do it. Sometimes it can slow you down and bring you back down to earth a little bit Agreed. in terms yeah. of getting your thought process and creativity um, in the right order, and and only shooting what you wanted to shoot. And maybe you'll find one of those little happy accidents as well creatively when something else doesn't work in conjunction with your. I'd kit. be amazed if you didn't. I would be amazed if you didn't. I think I think you will you will definitely take take some shots and you'll you'll see the results that you like. That was not exactly what I was expecting, but I do kind of like it. Yeah. And at the same token, I would say anybody that's going to shoot any of those things, whether you shoot colour or black and white, then and then make sure you print one of those out from the film because it's pointless shooting it otherwise. Because it does have, like Jake said, a different organic look to it. Which just has a little sort of a, well, for me, a bit of a warm feeling. It's different because digital is very sharp. Digital cameras nowadays is very, very sharp, almost too sharp. I mean, I, I, you know, don't get me started on noise. this. Man. Don't yeah. get me started on this. Yeah. <laughs> I add noise to my digital work just to remove that sharp edge a little bit. But um, 
yeah, get out there. And, you know, for, for people that they got medium format cameras with no light meter in them, um, you know, you then have to go and get a light meter. But, you know, light meters in those old analog cameras were, yeah. There, there is uh, actually, in, in fairness, there's actually some very, very good uh, <laughs> apps that you can get on your phone for light meter. If you, if, obviously not flash, but if you're just doing daylight stuff out, you can you can certainly spot meter and that sort of stuff as well with apps on, on your phone. So, you know, it, it costs you a couple of quid to get yourself uh, a light meter that is absolutely fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. But also take into account, I, mean, I think an important part, which beginners may not know and realize at the moment that there used to be variants in the film as well. I could buy one batch of, you know, um, Kodak Porter 160 for a fashion shoot. And I might buy another batch a month down the line and the same 160 ISO or ISA. ASA, sorry, that colour may look slightly different on that batch because the chemical process of the emulsion has somehow shifted in production. Well, compound so, that with the fact that, the, that you may <laughs> take your film to the to the lab and, and the lab may be using slightly older <laughs> chemicals than they did the last time as opposed to a fresh batch or the yes. chemicals were, you know, were, were, were colder. Different temperature. Different time of yeah. year that, you know, temperatures of the, of the chemical may have changed. Obviously it shouldn't do, but trust me, I used to work in a lab for many, many years and it did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it certainly yeah. did. Uh, and, you know, that's that, that's just, but that's all part and parcel of it is, you know, it's, it's about, like, like you were just saying, Wayne, it's just about letting go of that per- perfection, this idea of, <laughs> yes. like, we are creatives, we're artists, Liberating. we're not, you know, we're not physicists or architects, you know, it's just, just, just let yeah. go a little bit, you know, and it, it, it'll be fine. And and sometimes I think in the digital age, you know, people are so ramped up on the technical, uh, technological advancements that they forget to be creative. You know, they forget that the, the camera they're holding is just a digital box that records what they create, uh, but it has some convenient functionality in it. And I think sometimes cast yourself back and just be a creative first, taking into account all the elements and go and shoot some analog film because it's an enjoyable experience and quite calming in that respect because obviously you shoot a lot slower and a lot less. Yeah, there is the other, um, definitely that element as well, yeah. Definitely that element. Yeah. And I, I know that um, you and I are going to... Um, have some studio time together. Um, we haven't scheduled a date yet, but we're going to have some studio time together where we're both going to pull our systems in and um, and shoot our own thing in the same studio, but you know, shoot it independently. And one may shoot colour, one may shoot black and white. Who knows? Or or both. But we will get that, and then we can, we can share that in a future episode. And perhaps you know, oh, we can. Oh, are we? Beat. Okay. <laughs> we could do a little B- BTS on YouTube or something so people can uh, see the setups and then we can share some results or, or not, depending on the outcome. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, just, just, just on that as well. I like, don't, don't feel, if, if you're going to shoot film as well, I like, don't, don't feel like you have to share everything that you shoot. I know we're also in that mindset as well of our, uh, everything that we shoot, we need to share online. Like, yeah, just, don't. just, just shoot. If you're going to shoot film, don't, don't stress about it. Don't think, oh, I got to share this. I got to get content, yeah. you know, I got to get like, don't, just take that out of the equation and just do that for yourself. And you'll, you know, I think you'll find that it'll be far more, far, far less stressful than if you're like, Oh my God, I've got to get a usable frame here. Yeah. Good, good, good advice. Yeah. Don't, don't worry about what other people think, just shoot it for yourself. Go and shoot for yourself. And that way, It'll be, it'll be a happier shoot for you, I think. Mm. Um, and more rewarding, yeah. more rewarding. But there's, if you haven't ever shot film, there's, there's a lot to learn. So Is it, I, I'm don't, telling don't be you, worried man, about seen making a whole mistakes. generation of, of, of photographers coming of age now who have never shot film and, and are, who are looking into it. We are definitely seeing a, in my opinion, we're definitely seeing a... And younger so, generation. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Young, young people now, you know. Amazing. Amazing. But I mean, if anybody's got any questions post-show um, with regards to anything analog or, or specifically to each of our systems that we've currently got or that we've mentioned in this show, sort of the uh, Pentax 6.7 and the um, Mamiya RB67 Pro S or even the film types we've mentioned, um, please fire away and you can send that to podlomania at gmail.com. We, we will pull those in and we may answer them in another episode. But we've got some questions this episode. Wayne. We have got some questions, mate. Yeah, we can we can share these, can't we? One name we both know, he's an avid follower in the US. Um, this is from Dave Schick. Um, thanks, Dave, for sending this in previously. And it's concerning film. How laborious is the process to make film digital? Do you scan the negative or do you scan a print and then edit it? Dave, in that answer, um, you always scan the negative. Um, because if you're scanning a print, you're scanning like a completed picture 
with a different emotion. It's another step in already. the so, process. You want to limit the yeah. amount of steps in, in, in the process yeah. as much as possible. Yeah. Scan the original. Scan the film. Um, and like Jake said earlier, there are some labs that, um, you know, when you buy a film, when you send in it, when you send it in to be processed, they also offer a scanning service with the processing fee as well. So it means that you get your negative film back and you also get your digital scans at the same time. Now, if you shoot, if you're shooting black and white, then of course the chemicals are different. Um, you don't need sort of temperature controlled um, developing baths and things like that. You you can develop your own black and white film at home. You can still buy the kits online and the chemicals. It's actually not, it's not that expensive that either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't even and you don't need to convert the uh, bathroom to a dark room with the red la- la- light bulbs <laughs> and that it. sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. those those things that you see in films. That's only yeah. for the actual printing of the uh, printing. Yeah. Site. If you just want to deb yeah. your own films, you can definitely do that yourself with with very limited fuss. Um, and yes. obviously, you would then need to scan them yourself. But yeah, and then there are many um, flatbed scanners on the market for scanning negatives and and, and positives or slides as well. Um, you know, you look at I know Canon make it a good nine thousand series. Um, can't remember the prefix of that but they make that. But if you send them to a lab, they will generally be scanned on a drum scanner um, where they put their negative on a glass drum and then coat it in oil and seal it in and then scan the image that way for maximum resolution. So to give you just an um, idea of cost on that, like I mentioned before, yeah, it cost me about £10 to get a uh, roll of 120 C41 uh, debbed and scanned on, like, and that's high res. So, you know, that's TIFFs and they're about 120 meg TIFFs or something when they come back. So, um like it's, I mean, no point in having them any higher resolution than that because you're already seeing the grain at at, at that at that resolution anyway. So, and um, um, quickly before we get into the next question, one thing we didn't mention: if you want to get really creative, you can cross process your films. You, you, you getting, can getting develop now, Wayne. You can color. You can develop E6 slide film in C41 chemicals and vice versa. And I would say research that online first, so you can see some examples of how creatively that will. I'll put it politely: mess your colors up. Um, in a we used to do a lot way, with you... um, fashion back in the day, just just because the colours would yeah. just just jump out. It would, you know, very completely just, different. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful look. Yeah. Do you want to do the next question, Jake? We have Hank in Arizona here, and he asks, "Do you have a favourite film? Do you have one at the moment? Titanic, mate, absolute absolute killer." <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I presume I presume Hank is talking about uh, yeah. style of film. Trust so, you to go for Titanic so, <laughs> and Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day, mate. Valentine's <laughs> Day. I, honestly, if it wasn't for copyright strikes, I would I would start singing. Um, I, I it's it's early days for me, and I think what I used to shoot years ago um i used to shoot a lot more fuji years ago uh but mm. I, I've, I've been recently going back to the uh, we got the kodak portraits here and i recently just picked up some rolls of the lomography film because that's supposed to be very very ah. saturated um that's a hundred iso lomography nice. film so that's super saturated so i just thought that might that might work with some of my gel stuff but for me, it's still early days. And I would I would agree with Wayne on the black and white. The would you say the uh, would you say T Max? What did you say? Which ones did you say? Uh, no, you've got T Max and Tri X. Um, Tri yeah. Tri X was the more more favourable for me because of the contrast and the grain. It's slightly less um, contrast in that one. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, so Tri Tri X. I mean, they they did that in a range of uh, speeds, four hundreds, eight hundreds, and things like that. Um, that's nice. I, I I use some of that. But for the really contrasty stuff with a finer grain, I might add. Um, I just imagine all these people listening going, "What, what the, what the crap is grain?" You know, um, True. with a with a finer grain, I've I've currently, like I say, got the the Acros, the Fujifilm Acros, um, black and white in in my okay. in my camera, okay. which I'm looking forward to. Color wise, yeah, I used to use uh, sort of Provia and Velvia a lot, fashion wise, um, but for sort of more of a flat color tone, um, a flat palette with warmer skin, um, definitely I used to use the the Kodak Porter 160s, yeah. Portra, portra yeah, I mean, I, I was the same. I used to shoot a lot of the Fuji, but I have to, I, I don't know, maybe it's age or something. I do prefer the slightly um, softer, more neutral tones of the uh, Kodak the ones. I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's favourite films for me at the moment. Uh, I'll be interested to see your Lomography one though, mate, to, in all fairness, see what, see what uh, comes out of that. It's definitely punchy, yeah. It actually looks more like E6. You know, um, transparency. Oh, okay. You know, just you know, you know that contrasty, saturated look. Yeah, what it, yeah, what it yeah. Like. yeah, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. It'd be interesting to see that when you've when you've yeah. got a roll off. Um, okay, so we've got uh, 
Anna in Germany. Do or don't, don't you find? Do you find? Do you find focusing with these systems difficult compared to modern cameras with autofocus? Hell shit, yes. Because remember, these are all manual focus systems. And in our medium format, Jake and I both explained that we both have different kind of focusing screens in our viewfinders, if you want to call them viewfinders. I have no center crosshair, no center point, no nothing. It is literally just a clear square window with some guidelines to which orientation I've got my six, seven in. I don't envy you on that one. And, and I have to focus that, um, you know, until my eye thinks it's sharp. Now, it's a really easy process to focus. Um, I just think it's my age, my bloody eyesight, mate, to be honest. <laughs> it's causing, causing any say, issues though, in there. Manual focusing <laughs> is, is a skill like anything else. This is not something that, oh, I must be doing it wrong or what am I missing? Or like it, like when people start doing it, it is difficult. It, and I know it doesn't make sense, especially if you haven't done it, you think, well, you just turn the knob until it's in focus. Like what, how, what's difficult yeah. about it? You are essentially waiting for your eye to recognize when something is sharp. Um, so for me, you know, a, a technique is to, you know, do do large shifts with the focusing. So focus in and out and then just do smaller and smaller. And then, and then you're going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, rather than just fine tuning it in. I, I find it easier to do big shifts to begin with, and then just fine tune that down to the smaller shifts that, you know, to get in focus. But it is a skill like anything else, and it will get easier the more that you do it. Yes. Yeah. It's harder with medium format, obviously, because of the, the physical size of the camera and the weight, you know, if, unless you've got it on a tripod and you, you've got a fixed composition in, in a studio or an environment, um, it is trickier but you've got the chimney uh, as well so i mean it's like you've got a lot of peripheral crap that's going on in, in your eyesight as well for yeah. me i'm just looking straight down the barrel so it's like it's, it's yeah. it is a little bit easier yeah and it is worth you know if you've, if you've got it perhaps get the uh, the prism finder for the for the mummy or something like that because um then you can look through it like a normal dslr camera that you're used to um, and that's the difference also between the rb67 and the rz67 the rz had a fine focus wheel behind the main focusing ballot. Well, that probably goes so on to our next your... question. So do you want to cover that one? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. So it is. Oh, yeah. Jerry in, in LA. It's funny. We got no questions from people in the UK, I don't think. Um, Let's not talk about it. Um, what's, the, <laughs> what's the difference between the RB and the RZ? Um, that They both have rotating backs. So that's a similarity. They both look similar. The RZ is the newer of the two. Um, and even though it's bigger, it's not made from iron and steel. I say that because the RB is quite heavy. It's heavier than the RZ. The RZ is electronic. That's the difference. So there are electronic contacts between the lens and the body and the body in the back, and they all talk to each other like you'd expect. So it takes a battery. The RB is completely manual, as in, you know, it's only cogs and springs and levers. And a focusing wise, they both have the same focusing method with the bellows and the big focusing wheel on the side. But the RZs, they have a, a second focus wheel closer to the body behind that, where you can do very fine focusing adjustments instead of large focusing adjustments. So that in itself can be quite nice as well. But again, not a camera you want to be doing a lot of moving photography with unless you're an absolute demon with your focusing skills. As, as, yeah, um, it is that, more of a studio-based camera. Uh, yeah, I think that raises a, another good point there as well, is if you are looking to get a you know medium format or any film camera, you know, think about the sort of stuff that you're going to be shooting. You're going to be shooting you know, just street street photography. Do you want something you know, fast, nimble? Um, or you're going to be shooting landscapes. You know, I, you know, I think those, those chimney viewfinders and stuff where a little bit slower process, uh, you know, great for for landscape, especially the heavier bodies, you know, whack it on a tripod, you can get beautiful quality images. Um, but it has a little, you know, it takes a little bit more time. Um, and for me, uh, another reason why I went through, you know, what went for the Pentax there was, was because, you know, I knew I was going to be shooting in a studio and uh, wanted to be able to have that viewfinder, you know, straight off the bat to be able to see and, and, and compose yeah. and focus a little, a little bit easier. Isn't that bizarre? Because I, I've gone, I guess it's what, you know, what I've been used, used to. to. I've yeah. gone back to the... Well, I used to shoot R, on those. RB. I've never shot on this, but I've always yeah. wanted one. Always, always wanted one. Ah, yeah. okay. Yeah, it, it's it's funny. Yeah, you, you go to what you, you like and you love. I mean, you know, I've, I've had Hasselblad 500s in the past. I've still got an RZ Pro 2 um, system as well. It's Bigger Brother, but I just wanted the old analog man and manual mechanical version. Um, uh, and it was in really good condition as well. So cool. Uh, so that's that one. Thanks, Jerry, for that one. Um, that's just a di the little differences between. There are some other things, um, some differences between them, but that's the the main ones, if you will. One's mechanical, one's electronic is the the biggest thing. Um, so if you have an RZ and your battery dies, you're screwed. I can carry on because it's mechanical. There you go. Um, okay, Jake, you want to do the next one? A question here from uh, Matthew Hicks. 
Big brother, little brother, not related at all. Yeah, well, I say no, no relation, but I will just, just a quick tangent. To my knowledge, <laughs> the Hicks come from uh, a very, like, well, as far as I'm aware, come from a very small island off the uh, south coast of, of the UK here called the Isles of Scilly. Um, and I've been there and... <laughs> Scilly, the appropriate yeah, Exactly, <laughs> yeah. I've been there and this island, it can't be more than a couple of miles across at most. Um, and the... Uh, Visited the uh, churchyard, the graveyard, and every single headstone in there is Hicks. <laughs> wow, wow! Now, so I'm so not saying this, this guy's that, so still Matthew, going. <laughs> uh, we met like uh, we're not directly related, but like there's a pretty strong chance. Let's be honest. Like we were, I think, I think we were very, we were a very close knit family on that island. Should we say? Um, but anyway, after that, after that tangent uh, from yeah. Matthew's, Matthew's question was, where do you go for film printing these days? Um, he's, he's got multiple parts here, so I'll just quickly cover that. Uh, I, I just, I don't print anything out at the moment um but if i was to get stuff printed uh when i get stuff printed commercially i use the metro lab in in london Mm -hmm. that's where i get mine done Um, but at the moment when it comes to film uh, i'm just getting mine devved with a company called film dev um they're in the Midlands somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And, and likewise, Metro is a big main lab for me and I use print space as well for, for printing stuff. So that's cool. But Metro, especially for, for analog film is... is yeah, they're, all, yeah they're, they're, they're super helpful and um, yeah, they, they will so if you're listening, sit, sit through it. If you're listening, Metro, sponsorship for the next show would be... Uh, <laughs> would be, uh, yeah. well, would, would be yeah, nice. Thank it. you. That's um, it. They're done. <laughs> that's it. About a uh, second part of the question was, what, what would your choice of medium format... What would be your choice of a medium format camera to get started with? Um, yours may Gosh. differ. I would probably say if you're if you haven't used film before and you've never got into um, shooting film or anything like that, but you want to jump straight into medium format, I would probably go um, Mamiya six four five would probably be my probably be my advice as a starter camera. I think that has a lot Tied. of um, sweet a lot of benefits. Uh, relatively inexpensive. Um, and has, yeah, you know, so ha- has some, how should we say, uh, quality of life benefits and that sort of thing as well w- with that camera. Um, you get a decent number of uh, shots on a roll of film and that sort of thing. So already the cost comes down get from more. printing and, and, uh, and, and, and devving, but yeah, Mimir 645, that's, that's the one that I started on back in college. Um, yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm definitely definitely worth having a look at that one for sure yeah i mean that's that's a list in itself isn't it of you know analog medium format film cameras we could we could go through many of those you know from well-branded ones to russian branded copies and things like that that are out there it's um but i think i think that's a, a good safe bet safe choice that's a really nice camera to use i think and there were so many uh, of them quite, I think you could probably I think you could definitely yeah. pick pick one of those up for for a couple hundred uh, quid. Yeah, 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 I should think so. Yeah, yeah with yeah. a lens, with a lens probably as well, a couple hundred quid. So maybe even less, you know. Depending. Agreed, yeah. yeah. Cool. Do you, want to, do you want to cover okay. on the next section of that one? Yeah, as I haven't used a film camera in a studio, have workflows and equipment changed? Uh, is it all pretty much interchangeable? Um, well, the film cameras, in terms of interchangeable, they'll, they'll remain the same as they were, um, you know, right to the end of production. In a studio, I mean, you've just got to make sure that if you're using flash or, you know, continuous light like Jake was using, you just got to make sure you obviously buy the right film for its purpose for your for your setup and it and again if you're buying an old camera and it's not one you already own make sure that you test the pc socket on it to plug your kate your um your flash connection into if you're using flash i presume that was a um, jive at me uh i don't know what you mean there mate what's that <laughs> <laughs> or, well you've not had any problems with least, some misfires if you, are going to, uh, if you are going to do it then don't put a roll of film in before you start testing that <laughs> yeah and i'd say you know at least try and fire quite a few frames off because we know with older cameras they do degrade and the contacts may degrade inside and you know like you've encountered jake with yours you might fire three frames and the fourth one doesn't fire so, so it might just be I wasn't thing. aware. Yeah, so on, on my on my camera and on some of the older film um, cameras, you have a couple. You have two uh, sync sync ports. One is named X, and one is named FP. FP is the slower what the slower sync. It was used for the for the old uh, basically almost like a powder flash. So it was a far slower one. <laughs> and the X is for the xenon gas. So the more m- modern ones um now very thankfully it was in my opinion just a third up 
connector point. So I just um, plug. Uh, so when I when it wasn't firing that first roll uh, after I'd after the shoot, I just plugged in and unplugged the um, sync cable into it about fifty times. Um, and I will say I fired two rolls uh, through it on yesterday, day before, and not a single misfire. So like Wayne's right, just um, if you can clean those connectors, then do it. I mean, it's such a small hole that I just managed to just unplug and plug in the, the, the thing and that hopefully touch wood has has fixed the problem yeah just real quickly i just had a look when uh, wayne was answering that question matthew and yeah you can pick up mamir 645 here anything from 300 to 500 pounds so yeah yeah good 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 okay mate do you want to do the, the last question and then we'll round the show off yeah yeah uh simon gill have you tried any of the weird films yet? Pre-exposed, leak, odd colour responses or so on. And how did you find the results? So Simon's referencing uh, a trend that we see, especially on Instagram and stuff now, of people using expired film um, or very old film that is out of date and may have received some light damage over time and that sort of thing. And this, you know, this sort of leans into this uniqueness again, you know, because people are using films that have maybe been expired for 10, 15 years. uh, And, you know, the colors that you get from it are absolutely unique. You know, you can't, you can't get that with a, with another role. They're going to be very unique colors to that. Thanks to the fact that it's been uh, you know, it, 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 it's old film and like, you can get some beautiful shots. I mean, it can be a little bit hipster um, to, to do it. But that being said, you can get some beautiful results. Um, and, and, and especially if you're shooting appropriate content with it. So don't just get expired film and then try and do like a, yeah. like a gap advert in a, in a studio, which is going to look stupid, you know? So um, I personally haven't shot any of these expired films yet uh, i shoot a lot of expired polaroid and mixed mixed results but no it's it's not it's not my it no it's not my bag yourself wayne have you done anything i've, I've got a couple of rolls of um well expired 120 roll film in fridge some kodak two, but it's 220 roll film and i've i don't have any cameras that'll take 220 oh, at the moment okay. only 120 okay. yeah so that's going to sit there for a bit longer and just be expired for longer really but yeah i, I think yeah it, it's 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 good if you can experiment but you know i'd say experiment after you've actually learned how to shoot normal film in the first place i thought comment um, yeah because exactly. you, want, cause you yeah. have too many variables it's like was that the dodgy film or was it the fact that the flash didn't fire or was it the fact that i didn't have the sync speed up or was it the fact that i underexposed it yeah you don't want too many variables at, at at the start you're right Wayne yeah you're right yeah well brilliant mate I think that's that's a, a good episode and we should round it off now or else we'll be we'll be gassing forever we can always do another episode on this later on in life if people want to come up with questions and things yeah I want to see if I can actually try and get like a like a full full time analog shooter on um, so if anybody's got any mm. suggestions of uh, like a like a full time a- a- analog yeah. shooter then please please let us know well yeah. Simon Simon Lippman putting it out there um, I know you shoot digital but I know you still shoot commercially and you still shoot um, sorry you still shoot film commercially commercially in the current market so um I, i'm trying to get simon on anyway nice, nice wink, wink simon there you go it's out live on air i'd like to get that um willem verbeck in new york young young lad on he's um he's, he's got some beautiful stuff and I, I, I like his attitude that he has to it as well he'd be good to get on yeah brilliant brilliant mate well i think well, we'll we'll try and get him on as well that's that's great well mate i think we should round this off now and and then wrap this episode up sounds good man sounds good but just to say to everyone i mean you just just treat this episode as a, a nice creative inspirational version for you going back to the old school days of analog film and buying cameras like mine which is over 30 years old and still working great and uh, we will catch you in the next episode and we just want to let you know we've got fashion and celebrity portrait photographer Dan Kennedy coming up soon in good. another in an episode at the end yeah. of this month which would be amazing um, really nice guy and so so talented did you want to let any, anybody know about the stuff that we've got coming up Wayne I know both you and I are going to be uh, demoing at the photo show here in Birmingham in the UK we are indeed yeah I'm going to be at TPS um and that's I'm going to be on the Fujifilm stand and on the live stage as well, doing a live demo and um, confirmation. Put that on air. Probably going to be on the Pixapro stand as well. Um, and yourself, Jake? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll be up there. I'll, I'll be doing some um, live demos, lighting and stuff. That'll be for uh, Pixapro and presumably, I think I'll be doing it on the Monday, Tuesday, doing a couple of. Mm-hmm. Um, 
couple of demos there. So those of you not aware, that's, what is it, March the 14th to 17th? 14th to yeah. 17th, yeah, yeah indeed, yeah. yeah, March 14th to um, 17th. And just on that as well, um, anybody interested in learning more about studio lighting, remember I do have a couple of workshops coming up March 7th, Creatively Simple Lighting, so that'll be using pastel gels and um, flash in sort of smaller home studios. And then March 27th, it'll be using the Art of Projection, which is using a projector as your lighting modifier and everything that that involves. So yeah, nice. check that out, jkickphotography.com. Yes, perfect. And I've got more workshops coming up with Fujifilm as well. So I'll be doing a range of uh, in-house at the House of Photography workshops and across the country. Um, and I will be obviously doing a lot of demos with the GFX and medium format digital versions. Um, and that will be fashion and beauty. So you can generally see those coming up on my on my page at uh, waynejohns.com forward slash workshops. Um, so keep an eye on those as well. But I just want to thank all of you for listening to this episode. It's been fun for us to talk about what we love a little bit um, as well. And remember, if you want to help us to produce and record even more great interviews and content for your ears with some of the world's greatest creative talents, your support is very much appreciated. And to stay up to date and to be the first to know about new episodes on all creative things from the photography and video world, make sure you subscribe to the podcast at podlamania.com forward slash subscribe. And again, please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and podlamania.com. And don't forget to give us a like and leave a comment. At the end of that one, I just want to thank everybody for listening. Thanks, Jake, guys. Thanks again, mate. It's been another brilliant episode. And we That's good. It flew by. I can't everybody. believe it's been, it's been that long. It's crazy. Yeah, absolutely crazy. Who would have thought that you and I could uh, gas on for so long? It's bizarre. Who Why would not? know, mate? Who would know? Hey, it's keeping it short for us as well. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, everybody, thank Take you ever care, so guys. much, and we'll catch you in episode twenty-three. Thank you. Bye.